All right, so this is the second edition of the Polynomial Commitments VK Study Club session with Justin Drake. Um, we, today we're gonna actually continue on from what Justin had started last, uh, two weeks ago. Uh, I think if you haven't already, it's probably good to watch that video. Um, I think the plan for today is to go very quickly through those slides and then launch into the second part. And I think we'll leave it up like again to time. So Justin, if you wrap up quickly, then we can end in an hour. If you don't, maybe we can like schedule something for the new year or for the holidays. Um, but yeah, welcome again. Okay, great. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, so I'll just quickly go through what we covered last time uh, very quickly and then slow down uh, where we live. Uh, any chance you could share the link to the slide? Yes. Um, Anna, did, can you share it in the table? Sure. I'll do that. Thank you. Is it, it's the same slides as last time, right? Yes. Great. Okay, so polynomial commitments, they're like this really cool cryptographic primitive. Uh, super useful in the context of universal SNOCs, uh, which is kind of the, the new hot way of building uh, SNOCs. Um, oops. Um, so, you know, the, basically, I started with giving some context, including historical context on, you know, when these polynomial commitments were first defined. Um, the first construction was by Katia in 2010, and then we saw kind of bulletproofs and fry kind of give uh, uh, polynomial commitments, but kind of hidden. Um, um, and then, you know, we have this IOP and polynomial commitment kind of framework, and we've had lots of innovation on the uh, um, uh, IOP side of things. Um, and um, now we have this, this is kind of explosion, uh, partly because we, we better understand, I think, kind of the separation of concerns between the cryptography, the polynomial commitment, and the IOP. So I think this is a really um, nice framework to, to innovate on uh, in the future. Um, so I kind of briefly gave the definition of a polynomial oracle and the polynomial um, commitment scheme. And um, the idea of an oracle is it's kind of a, an abstraction, which kind of, um, tries to encode the, uh, a, a polynomial, which could be extremely large with lots of coefficients, into just a, a single object which can be queried. Uh, so you can uh, make a query which will be asking for the evaluation of that polynomial at a point. Uh, and then we have the equivalent um, uh, commitment scheme uh, on the cryptography side of things. And then we, you know, we have some formal definitions uh, for cryptographers and by cryptographers. Um, and then this is kind of the, the framework that was uh, uh, presented. So we have um, kind of three, three buckets. We have kind of the computer science bucket where there's a lot of compiling going on. You have a uh, code and then you compile it into programs, RAM programs or circuits. And then you encode these into polynomials and things like that. Um, and then you have this information theory land where you have the interactive oracle proof as kind of the, the meat of your proof scheme. And then you have the uh, polynomial commitment scheme um, here. And then at the end, when you mix, uh, mix all this, you get a, a universal snark, which is very nice. Um, and yeah, like different flavors of soundness. We go from perfect soundness to statistical soundness and then uh, computational soundness. And then, um, kind of, if we look at um, the different oracle types that you can instantiate, which are alternatives to uh, polynomial oracles, you know, you can think of set oracles or vector oracles or low degree test uh, oracles or even inner product oracles. And kind of there's this hierarchy because they have different um, kind of power and they're kind of related to each other um, locally. and um, Kind of historically, the way we've built snarks is, is with this inner product um, argument, uh, which is kind of very costly because you either have to pay uh, on the verifier time, so you lose succinctness, for example, in the case of bulletproofs, um, or you have to pay with a trusted setup, which is not universal. Um, and so we've kind of dialed it down to just this polynomial commitment uh, scheme, which kind of reduces the expressiveness of the um, 
of the PCP, but uh, it's still you know powerful enough to do everything we want to do. Uh, that's kind of great news uh, here. So the kind of the sweet spot is the commitment here. And then I kind of gave an overview of okay, what are these schemes in, in practice? So we have kind of four flavors. One, which is basically based on fry, which is hash functions. Um, and here you basically, the way that you commit is you, um, you evaluate your polynomial over a domain, um, and then you take the, the Merkle root of these evaluations, and that's your commitment. Um, you have pairing groups, um, where you have <clears throat> this kind of uh, powers of tau, so you encode a secret, and then basically you evaluate your polynomial at that secret point in the exponent. Um, and then you have groups of an own order, um, where here you do something very similar, except that there's no secret. Um, and, and then we have the final flavor. Um, my slides will load, um, which is based on uh, on the discrete uh, log, uh, which is also very similar to the previous two. And, and these three are kind of um, very algebraic, whereas this one is, is not so algebraic. I mean, it does use algebra a little bit because it's based on the, on the roots of unity. So you can do clever tricks, uh, but it's, it's very much an information theoretic uh, construction, this one. Um, and then we kind of saw kind of the, the, the benefits and the downsides. And basically, there's a, there's a very large trade of space that you can uh, uh, pick from so you, if you you know you can have transparency you can have um, post quantum you can have an unbalanced setup um, all, all all these things are very different constructions and even within the groups of unknown order we kind of have these two flavors we have the RSA group and the class group um, and then in addition to kind of comparing performance uh, comparing setups um, kind of in terms of the the, the qualitative properties, we can also look at them in terms of their uh, quantitatively, like um, what are their performance, and um, there's also kind of a wide, uh, a wide uh, trade of space. And this is kind of where we left it uh, last time. Um, and you know, one of the comments that was made here was that this is a little unfair because we're basically um, hiding the um, the, the security parameter in, in, in various places. And so it means that we're not really comparing um, kind of apples to, to oranges. So for example, on the, on the prover time and the verified time, these are different operations. You know, these are multi exponentiations uh, inside the group and you know, these are you know, um, hash operations. So I, I just wanted to give a little bit of flavor um, uh, regarding this, uh, this security parameter. And so what I'm going to do is basically give you the, the, the breakdown for the, um, for the commitment. So, right, I, I, you know, I, I mentioned that basically all these commitments, uh, polynomial commitment schemes have a constant size commitment. Um, but actually, in, in, in practice, they, they, the commitment is, is, has a different size. So not... Um, <clears throat> So, uh, you know, we have, uh, for example, the, uh, in, in Fry, you know, your commitment will be just one um, hash, hash function output, uh, whereas for all the other ones, basically, your, your commitment is going to be one group element. And these groups are going to have uh, different sizes. And basically, the, 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 for, for, the, for the algebraic um, constructions, the, the size of the group is... Um, going to contain these relatively large um, powers of lambda. So you have lambda to power three, lambda to power three, and lambda to power two. And you know, relative, they're large relative to, for example, the, 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 the hash function here. Um, and the reason is that you have these kind of sub-exponential um, attacks here. So, <clears throat> um, so they're, they're, they're kind of... Um, Algebraic attacks, which are sieve based, so you have the uh, general uh, number field sieve uh, algorithm, for example, that, that is used. Um, and this is kind of interesting to, to see that, that there is some correlation between um, the asymptotics of, of the attacks and uh, kind of the actual uh, size 
um, of, your, of your group elements. So for example, if you look at RSA groups and class groups, they're both groups of unknown order, but there's kind of different attacks that are known here. Um, <clears throat> uh, and so this will mean that for RSA, if you're targeting 128 bits of security, you actually have a, a larger um, a group, group size, um, um, 3,000 bits, versus a class group, which is going to be only 1,800 bits. And um, these, these discrepancies between the various um, commitment sizes will also reflect in the uh, proof size. So basically, you, know, you have a factor of, let's say, 10 difference between an, a SHA-256 output and a um, 3000 bit um, RSA um, group element. And um, th this is something that I'm uh, sweeping under the rug uh, when, when you consider um, here uh, and, and here the, the, the proof size. So you're gonna have something similar. And you know, this, this table here also kind of sweeps under the hug, rug um, <clears throat> a bunch of uh, detail regarding the verifier time uh, and, the, and the prover time. So for example, here, um, you know, uh, the pairing will, um, will have a, a, a bunch of, of uh, lambda terms, uh, which you know, in practice will actually uh, mean that you're, you're comparable to, to Fry, for example, which has a, uh, a, log, a log D squared. So, I mean, one, one way to, to, to simplify uh, and, and compare these is just to set um, kind of log d to be equal to lambda, um, and then and then you have a, a, a way to compare them kind of uh, apple to apple on a, on a, on a bit level uh, operation um, standpoint. Okay, so that, that was just kind of an addendum uh, to the, the the previous talk, just to give a little bit of flavor um, as to as to what's what's going on with the the lambda terms here, uh, and it's kind of uh, you know, the what I'd like to talk about now is kind of actual mechanics of how the the schemes uh, work. Um, so I've told you how the commitment uh, works, but I haven't told you how you actually do the the openings. So any questions so far? Seems good. Also, just, just to note, anyone who's kind of new to this, if you do have a question kind of like, and don't want to interrupt, you can also put the note, you can put it in the notes we're sharing, sort of there's a chat here, and we can collect those for the next time Justin takes a pause. Okay, great. So let's, let's look into like how these schemes actually work. Um, and, you know, you'll notice that, um, a, like three of these schemes, the, the fry, dark, and bulletproof, they have, they have these lock terms. And this is, this is not a coincidence. And the, the reason is that um, the way they're, they're built is, you know, you have this, this log number of rounds of interaction between the prover and the verifier. And every round of interaction will have kind of a, a constant size overhead in the, in, in the uh, in, well, at least constant size overhead in, in, the, in, the, in the proof size. So, um, and, and what, what I'll do actually first is before giving you the, the full polynomial commitment scheme, I'll give you something slightly weaker, which is the, the low degree test um, for, for all the, 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 the flavors. So you have your prover, you have your verifier, and they're talking to each other in, in these three schemes. Um, and there's a, a log, uh, number of rounds. So D is your, the degree of your polynomial. You have log D rounds. Um, and in, in every round, the verifier is just sending a, a, a random challenge. So it's a, it's a public coin uh, protocol, uh, which can be made non-interactive with Fiat Shamir. And basically the way that the low degree test works is that you, you start with the, the commitment, which uh, you know, the, the prover uh, already sent, and then there's some sort of reduction step. So um, to go from, from f of zero to f of one, <clears throat> you basically reduce, and this reduction step is seeded by the randomness that was given by the, the verifier. 
And so the point of this reduction step is that you go from a polynomial of degree d to one of degree d over two. So you keep having and having and having and having. And after log d steps, you end up with a constant polynomial. Um, and kind of constant polynomials are very you know, easy to work with and the kind of the, the, the verifier can, can, can check that um, everything is, is consistent at this, at this lower level. And um, so you have this, this constant polynomial check and then you kind of work, the verifier will kind of work itself all the way back. So if, if, this, if this is constant, if f sub log, log d is constant, then the one just before is of degree you know, two, um, or actually maybe one, and then two, and then four, uh, and then eight, and 16. And so that way you, you get your low degree test. You can prove that, well, the verifier can be convinced that indeed this, this polynomial f of zero was, um, was small. And, and it, it turns out that if you, th this framework can also be used with, with pairings. So um, all, all four flavors of commitment schemes that we know can, can, can be made to, to fall into this framework. Um, it's just that for pairings, we have this extra power. That means that we don't even need to do all this interaction. We can just do it in one go. Um, so you'll get even shorter proofs of pairings, but if you want to, you can go through this, this framework. Um, so what I need to tell you now, um, so you already know how the commitments work um, and, and you have this framework. So all I need to tell you really is this uh, re reduce function. What, it, what is the reduce function and kind of what are the, the consistency checks? Um, and it turns out that there's, there's only so many ways that you can take a polynomial of degree D and split it and kind of reduce it into a polynomial of half the degree. And so you kind of have this, um, this even odd decomposition, which is kind of the, the Fourier decomposition. So you take the, uh, the, the even um, powers, you take the odd powers, and then each, each of even and odd are individually um, half, half the degree. Or you can think of the left-right decomposition, uh, where you take kind of the 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 the, the coefficients for the, the the small monomials and then those for the uh, large monomials um, half and half and then you, you also get um, kind of uh, two polynomials of of degree um, n over two um, and so basically each each scheme uses, um, uses slight diff a slightly different variant uh, on, on the decomposition. So for example, Fry will use the even and odd decomposition. Um, I mean, it turns out you can also use the left and right decomposition, but you get slightly, something slightly less efficient uh, because you, you, you can't use the same kind of uh, Fourier-like um, algebraic tricks um, to, uh, to basically uh, sh shrink by half the domain every time. But, but yeah, that's the technicality. So they use even and odd. And then you have um, groups of unknown order, which kind of use uh, left and right. But it turns out here that you could, you could also use even and odd, and the scheme would work you know, just as fine. And then, um, and so actually, just to back up here. So, um, you know, the, the, the very standard way of uh, combining things in, in, in cryptography is just to take a random linear combination. And, and so this is what we're doing here. R is the, the randomness. And so we're taking a, a random linear combination of these, these two things. Um, and so the R is going to be the, the randomness from the, from the verifier. And then in, in bullet proofs, we do something um, kind of like the groups of unknown order. So we split in left and right, but we, we do something, two things that are a little different. So one is that instead of taking just this unbalanced um, linear combination where basically you have, a, you have a factor of one and a factor of R here, you have this more kind of balanced linear combination where you take R here and R inverse. So this kind of this, this nice symmetry. 
And in, in addition to um, doing a, a decomposition at the, at the level of the coefficients of your polynomial, you're also going to do a random linear combination, a, a similar one for your, um, for the basis elements with which you do the commitment. So it, it's kind of a, a slightly trickier scheme because you, um, it's just a slightly more complicated reduction. But if you want kind of the, the, the universal reduction that works, um, that would work for all schemes kind of optimally, it would be um, R times even, so R times even plus R inverse times R right. So basically, um, it turns out that bulletproofs, you don't need to use left and right. You could also use even and odd. Um, and in, in these two schemes, uh, you know, it's, it's perfectly fine, it's, it's balanced, but, um, you know, it turns out that the way that these papers were written were, were not, you know, in, in the context of this more general framework, but it turns out that there's, there's this one kind of universal reduction function you can use, and it would work for all, all the schemes, uh, which is kind, kind of nice. Any, any questions so far? So, we have this framework where we have commit, reduce, commit, reduce. Every time the commitment uh, is, is of a function that, 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 that goes, reduces in size exponentially, you have a, a log number of rounds, and then you have these consistency checks, which I haven't gone into yet. Um, I have a question about the coefficients and basis. Like, can you go, can you maybe explain a little bit more what those two things are? Because I think you just sort of threw them in, but I, they're, I'm they not familiar with that. Yes. Um, okay, so that, that actually goes back to an old slide. Aha, this one here. So the way that you do the, um, the commitment in bulletproofs is, you have the, the, the coefficients of your polynomial, a zero up to a d, and you, you need to do it relative to a, a basis. So basically you have these uh, random elements, g, g, g zero to g d, and they were, they're independent from the discrete log perspective. There's no discrete log relationships between them. And so you can think of them as being basis vectors in this vector space. And so your commitment will be just this one point in, in, in the vector space. And it's kind of very similar to, to this. So you can think of, you know, Q to the I times G as being kind of your, your basis element. And you can also think of this, the same thing here for okay. the, the, the pairing. So we have S to the power I times G1, G1 being the generator of of your, your big G1 group as also being the, the, the basis element. Um, so yeah, these three schemes are very, very similar to each other. Um, and it, it turns out that the way you do the reduction, you, you don't have to mess around with the basis elements here. So you just keep using S to the power I G1 and you keep on using Q to the power I G. But for bulletproofs, you need to do, you need to be cleverer. Uh, and the reason is that when you work with a discrete log group, it's just less powerful, it's less flexible. So you have to, to do a bit more gymnastics. Okay. Um, so now, now, now I need to kind of go, go into the, the consistency checks. Um, and this is where the schemes kind of uh, become slightly different. Um, so in the case of uh, Fry, um, this is going to be your, your, your consistency check. Um, and it, it kind of looks um, a little bit strange, but basically if you, if you take the two to the Z and you, um, you, 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 you divide it out uh, everywhere. I just put two to the Z on this side. Then it turns out that this part is going to be the even part. Um, and this part is going to be the, the odd part. So um, you have this, uh, this evaluation point uh, Z, uh, which was 
kind of chosen at the very at the very end of the protocol. That's a uh, a, a random uh, evaluation point by the verifier. And it turns out that you can kind of check consistency of fi of z, fi of minus z, and fi plus one of z squared. So if we, if we kind of go back to this um, even um, odd decomposition, if you feed, um, if you feed z here, on the left hand side, you're going to get uh, z squared here and z squared here. And if you, if you feed minus z, well, the minus sign is going to, to go away. So you still get z squared here and z squared here. What changes is that you get a minus sign here. So you have um, kind of two linear, uh, two linear equations with, with two unknowns. And so you, you can kind of solve it. Uh, and it turns out that. Um, you can basically solve for the even part and for the odd part separately. Um, and this will be the even part. This will be the odd part. Um, and this will be your, your, your z squared. And for every opening that you have here, um, you have a corresponding uh, Merkel path. So if I, if I go back to, to, this, uh, to this picture here, every commitment here is a single Merkel root. It's, um, so you commit to Merkle root, commit, commit, commit. And these commitments are going to be commitments to evaluations over a domain. And so, um, you know, you, you can... Uh, just can you yeah. explain why the square, where does the square go? Uh-huh. So the, the, the square comes from here. So basically, um, even an, an odd, like the relationship between F, even part of F and odd part of F, you have this square part here. So the so reason- What creates this? Sorry, what? What creates this? What creates this? Okay, so let's say that you have um, uh, a polynomial and you want to take the even coefficients and you want to take the odd coefficients. Now, if you just take the even coefficients and the other ones, um, then the, this, these, these, these polynomials are still going to be of the same degree as D. So basically, uh, if your polynomial is going to be, let's say, x to the power four plus x squared, and you take the even part, you're still gonna have x to the power four plus x squared. Um, you haven't reduced the, the degree. So what you need to do is you actually need to, do, to consider the left part as a polynomial in x squared. So as a polynomial in x squared, you're gonna have x squared squared plus x squared. And then basically, if you wanna consider as a polynomial in a, in a new variable y, you're gonna basically have a y squared plus y. Does that make sense? So. Um, the, the reason you get the square is because once you do the decomposition into even and odd parts, you can kind of collapse all the squares into a new variable y, where y is equal to x squared. Cool. Thank you. And once you collapse, do this collapse, this collapse, this collapse, um, you basically have a, a polynomial of degree half the size. Um, yep. Yeah, so if you, if you just work through an example, it will, it will become very, very clear. Um, and in order to do the collapse on the odd part, you have to do a little bit more work. Basically, um, you need to, to, to extract um, an, an x coefficient because you have all, you have all odd uh, powers in the monomial. So you extract one x, and so you're left with um, all evens. And so there you can again, um, uh, kind of collapse the, the, the even ones into a new variable y, where y is equal to x squared. Okay, so okay, you- One more question Yeah. Um, uh, about the next slide actually. Is the uh, consistency check, is it the same for fry versus deep fry or is it different for deep fry, do you know? Yeah, so deep fry, they, 
from what I understand it, like the, the new idea is that this point Z is outside of the domain. It's kind of outside of the box. Um, and so here in Fry, you, you, you choose Z to be within your evaluation domain. And what that means is that um, you can have a direct opening proof. You have this Merkle root and you have the evaluations and you can just open them by providing the Merkle path. Once you evaluate outside of the domain, you know, it, it kind of gives you more flexibility as a verifier because now as a verifier, you can check anywhere in the whole, you know, in the whole field, but now you're putting more burden on the prover to convince you that, that the opening is, is the correct one. And, and I actually don't know exactly how, how deep fry works. Um, I mean, does anyone on the call um, know how, how a verifier would authenticate the claimed openings um, outside of the box in the context of deep fry? So what I do know is that it's like it's a no. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean it's on my to-do list to to read read, uh, read deep fry and understand it. But what I do know is that you get a bad, better soundness. Um, so, uh, yeah. so so this is like a, a half guess, but I think one way to do it is they they think of uh, the polynomial like f minus f of z divided by x minus z. And now if you have the evaluation of f on a limited domain that doesn't include z, you also have the evaluation of this thing right. on a limited domain. And you sort of, you're sort of using it like a polynomial commitment scheme. And now you can your evaluations of F on a limited domain give you evaluations on a limited domain of this thing. And you can use that to prove what F of Z is. Uh, that's my half guess from things I heard in talks. Yeah, so I think that makes a lot of sense because um, this trick that you just talked about where you consider f of x minus f of z divided by x minus z. This is something I will talk about next. And it's how you kind of take Fry and make it into a polynomial commitment scheme. And this was kind of noticed by the Matter Labs people. And they kind of noticed it after reading the Deep Fry paper. Because the Deep Fry paper kind of uses this, this exact same lemma, but in a different context. And I guess this different context is evaluations outside of the box um okay that makes a lot of sense so if, if you're slightly you know more clever you don't have to pick z which is within your domain you have this this trick which i will talk about in a few slides thank you so just to to recap this this consistency check is basically it, it basically encodes um, this, this equation here, there's nothing other than this equation. And the, um, the, the, the purple bits will be, uh, you know, part of the, of the proof. So the, there'll be proof elements. Uh, so you have log, a log number of these because you have log number of rounds. Uh, but the reason why you have this two factors of log in, in Fry is because each one of these elements also comes with a Merkle path, its size itself, you know, of, of log size. Okay, so um, now let, let me go to, to, to docs. So if you recall the, the commitment scheme, um, I'll just say it again for, for docs. So you have this, you have this group of unknown order, and then you pick one uh, generator, and then you you take um, this, this generator times f of q, where q is a very large uh, uh, integer. So basically, you take your polynomial, you encode it into an integer, and then you commit to the integer in the group of unknown order. Um, and this, this equation here basically is 
the, the exact kind of analog of, of this equation uh, of, of, of this equation here. Um, or maybe, uh, yeah, this one. So basically you're gonna have um, this, this, uh, this sum and you're gonna have the, the multiplication by a, by a shift. And so multiplying by Q is the same in, in your commitment is the same as multiplying by X in, in, the, in the polynomial land, in the uncommitted land. Um, and it turns out that um, if you take the, the sum of the commitments, you get the commitments of the sum. So you have this, um, uh, this, this nice linear property, uh, linear homomorphism. And so it, you can just directly work with the commitments and it, it's, it's, it's all simple. And the, and the RI here is the, gonna be the random linear combination. So again, just to, to recap, you have a, a polynomial F, which has a certain degree. You break it up into two um, smaller uh, coefficients, even and odd. You take a random linear combination here, and then you do the consistency check. Um, and here you have this nice kind of superpower of the, the commitment scheme for darks, which is it's kind of fully homomorphic in the sense that in addition to being additively homomorphic, you have this shift homomorphism. So you can multiply by X and multiplication by X is the same as multiplication by Q in, in commitment land. Does that make sense? <laughs> There's a little question in the chat if you wanna take a look from Ivan and also Ivan if you wanna Say it. Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, I might be mistaken here, but uh, fi plus one should be fi after the reduction, right? So shouldn't this be like uh, in the reverse order in the groups of unknown order? Yes. Yes, it does. It does look like I messed up my uh, i's and i plus ones. Yes. All right. Thank you. Mm. Yeah, and, 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 and Georgios is asking, um, is that the order should be unknown and big enough? Um, so, yeah, so you, you kind of have two kind of big enough things here. So first is you have the group of a known order in, in, the, in the basic kind of construction of your, of your group. And that just needs to be big enough and kind of, just difficult to compute the, the group of a known order. But there's another big enough that comes in, which is this, this Q. Um, and it, 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 it turns out that um, in, in order to do these, um, these, to apply the homomorphism, so to apply the addition homomorphism and to apply the shift homomorphism, you need to make sure that you, the encodings of your polynomials don't overflow. Um, so you have, uh, you know, if you, if you consider um, kind of polynomials, when you manipulate with them, the, 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 the coefficients of every monomial is, is independent um, and will, will not interact with the other ones. Uh, but um, when, when you work with uh, integer encodings of polynomials, then it becomes different because integers, when you multiply them, you have you have carries. So in order to avoid the carries, you just need to pick a large Q. Um, and so what you're gonna do in, in, in darks is when, when you reach the, um, when you reach the end here and you do the, the constant polynomial check, you're gonna do an extra check. Not only are you gonna check it's constant, but you're also going to check that it's a small constant. Um, and if you have a small constant here, that means you have a, a small, a polynomial here with small, small enough coefficients and, and you go up and up and up. Every time the coefficients can go larger and larger and larger, but you have, you have kind of a very controlled bound on, on how large these coefficients can be. Um, and they're basically small enough that you can do, apply all the homomorphisms that you need for the consistency checks.
Okay. Um, and kind of the, the, the final one, which is pulled under this framework of, of uh, a log number of rounds is, is kind of bulletproofs. And um, here what you do is that you, <clears throat> you, 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 you check that the commitment of you know, F, uh, I and Fi plus one are consistent. And then you have these, um, these extra terms here. Um, and these extra terms kind of correspond to um, kind of cross products. So remember you have, you have uh, basis elements and then you have the, the, the coefficients. Um, and it turns out that you, you kind of need to, to cancel off these cross products uh, for things to, to work out nicely. And um, yeah, so you have the, these residu residual terms. I, I mean, to me, bulletproofs is kind of the most confusing of, of all the schemes. Um, like the, the fry and dark, um, you know, even though this looks a bit dry, actually it's very, very natural. Um, here, there's a little bit of cleverness involved uh, to, come up, uh, to come up with this. Uh, but yeah, it, it works. Okay, so now now I've kind of told you um, like the, the 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 low degree test, but the low degree is not is not sufficient. You actually want a polynomial commitment scheme, uh, and so in addition to to knowing that something is a polynomial is kind of low degree, you also want to know what is the precise opening of f at at z. So you want to know this f of z, um, and uh, you know, as, as was mentioned, basically you have this trick uh, for, for Fry where, so it's, it's kind of the, the quotient trick and it's used in various places. It's kind of a, a, a neat trick to keep in mind. So if um, basically f of z will be the, the, the evaluation of f at z, if and only if f of x minus f of z is divisible by x minus z. So if you plug in z in both the left and right hand side, you get, you get f of z minus f of z, so that's zero. And here you also get zero. And so you have this, you have this quotient here. Um, and so generally the, the trick involves the, the, the prover, uh, yeah, kind of calculating the, the, this quotient and then uh, convincing that this, this is low degree. And, and so this, this is ex exactly what um, Fry, Fry does. So um, instead of showing that F is low degree, well, first it shows that F is low degree. Okay, fine. And now we want to know the opening. And so we're gonna, we want to open outside of the box. We want to open outside of the domain. And so how do we do that? Well, we just show that this is low degree because this is low degree if and only if you know, f of z is 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 the correct opening, um, and yeah. So there's a little technicality that you need to be within the the unique decoding radius, but uh, you know that's that that yeah that that's all there is. So so basically, Fry very easily kind of elevates into a, a polynomial commitment scheme, and this is what was noticed by the the Matter Labs uh, team. And then it turns out that this exact same trick is used uh, in the CATIS scheme. In this CATIS scheme, you can forget all the, all the gymnastics that you have to do with the, the, the prover and the verifier talking to each other. You can just do a, a, a single kind of direct proof. And what you do is that you, you basically check this equation in, in, in the exponent, basically, we're using pairings. So um, this, <clears throat> the commitment of F minus F of, so the, the verifier is, is already given the commitment of F. The prover is gonna commit, is gonna compute Q and, and commit to that. And, and this equation holding is basically if and only if um, this times this is equal to this times this. So you can kind of think of pairings as products. So it, it multiplies the left-hand side with the, the right-hand side. So what is the, the left-hand side here? 
is going to be f minus f of z. That's, that's good. And then what is the right-hand side? This is just the generator g2. So there's a little one which is hidden. So it's this times one, which is just this. Is it equal to q, which is this, times the right-hand side? And the right-hand side is going to be s minus z. s is going to be your secret point in the powers of tau. And so the s here will correspond to the x. Right, so th this, this pairing check uh, kind of Im immediately checks this, and so immediately proves that uh, the evaluation of, of f at z is f of z. Does this make sense? So, I mean, one, one reasonable to. Oh, sorry, uh, yeah, I have a question. Could, could you return to the, uh, like, uh, to the previous slide? Uh, could you repeat where is the even and odd side in Fry? Uh, like, and why? Uh, I still kind of. Okay. So um, I wish I had the kind of whiteboard. <laughs> um, but this would be the even part and this would be the odd part or vice versa. But I'm, I'm, I'm relatively sure this is the even and this is the odd part. Okay. So let, let's have a look. So. We're gonna let's look at f of f of z plus f of minus z. What is that equal to? Well, so we're gonna take this equation and imagine that you duplicate it. So you have you have f of f of z here, and then you have f of minus z. And basically, this this even part here is gonna be exactly the same, right? Because z and minus z squared, they're the same thing, right? So this part and this part, this imaginary part below are gonna be the same. Okay, now let's look at the right part here. The odd, odd, of, odd part here is gonna be of z and minus z is also gonna be the same because you have this squared here. But here, you don't have a square, right? So really what you're gonna have is gonna have a minus this part here, right? So you have f of z, and f of minus z. What if you add the two? You add these two. So you have this line here and the imaginary new line here with a minus instead of a plus. What if you add these two? Well, the, the plus and the minus are going to cancel, right? The, this, this odd part is going to disappear. And so you're going to get two times the even part, right? So basically, f of x, f of z plus f of minus z is it going to be equal to two times the even part of f evaluated at z squared. And yeah, I think I got that. Yeah. Yeah. That then, that. yeah, that's that. Yeah. So basically, does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, so so you also add like you also multiply by r the odd part, right? Yeah. So that's that randomness. That is the randomness in the linear. So it's here. Yeah. So, so far you don't have it. There's, so far, there's, yeah, there's no, there's no randomness involved here. It, it comes in here when you want to do the, the reduction. Because basically you have two polynomials, each of degree half. And if you, if you keep on kind of um, taking one polynomial and, and splitting it into two, then you kind of have an exponential blow up in the number of polynomials. Um, so what you want to do is you want to simultaneously keep the number of polynomials that you have constrained. And in this case, we have one polynomial at every step. But you also want the degree to, go, to fall down. And the way you achieve that is you do the decom decompose and then reduce with a, a, a random linear combination. All right, thank you. Yeah. So this is why I call it the decompose reduce kind of framework, I guess. Uh, and Actually, um, just so you know, we have ten minutes till the hour's up. So, okay, just, uh, I don't know if there's any <laughs> planning, but cool. Right. So, I mean, I think we can finish part three. Of Good. Uh, <laughs> and there'll be kind of an optional part four, um, which people might be interested in. Um, okay. Yeah. So this is how you do the openings for Fry and for for uh, Katy. And you use this, this really cool trick. Um, 
And I guess, you know, one natural question would be, okay, why does that trick not work for docs? Like, why can't I get like a, a single direct proof like, like parents? Because after all, kind of groups of unknown order, they have all these nice kind of homomorphic properties. Why can't I use them? And basically the, the problem is that you need Q um, to be, to have small coefficients. And in, in, it, it turns out that there's kind of two problems here that arise. One is if you do find such a Q, well, you still need to prove that it has small coefficients. And the, the, the way, the only way that I know of is basically that is efficient is to, to do this, this log number of rounds. So, um, you know, you'd still have to pay. But actually there's, a, there's another problem, which is that if you take the quotient of, if you take this part divided by X minus Z, what you'll get is a polynomial with random looking co coefficients. Um, and so they, 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 they won't even, like with very high probability, these coefficients won't even be small enough. They won't be small, they'll just be random. Um, some of them will be large. Um, and so you actually have a completeness problem. It's not just a soundness problem, but a completeness in the sense that you, you can't even prove this thing because Q is an object that you, you can't work with. You can't apply your homomorphisms uh, to. Um, yeah, so that's why you, you, you don't have this, this trick apply for, for docs. Okay. So now I need to tell you about how, how do you do the actual openings for the other two schemes, for docs and bulletproofs. Uh, we, we, we kind of have the low degree test, but we want to go a bit further than that. Um, and the way that it works for docs is that it's basically um, in line with, uh, with the, uh, the the, uh, the logarithmic number of rounds. So in addition to communicating commitments, you're also going to communicate evaluation points. And in the exact same way that you have a, um, a consistency check on the commitments, you can have the same similar consistency check uh, on, the, uh, on the evaluation points. So um, basically, Let's say that I'm interested in F evaluated at Z. Um, the prover, in addition to giving me the commitments of the even part and the commitments to the odd part, he will also give me the even part evaluated at Z and the odd part evaluated at Z. And I can just check is F of Z equal to the even part at Z plus the randomness times the odd part at Z. Um, yeah. Um, so actually there's a f of i plus one here and then f of i on the right hand side or vice versa. Um, so it's kind of an inline, inline thing that you do, uh, very similar here. And for bulletproofs, it turns out that the, the, the scheme can be na naturally thought of as an inner product argument. And so uh, what you do is that you, you, you're going to take the inner product of um, f, the coefficients of f, and the powers of z. This should say uh, powers of z, not powers of x. Um, and if you think about it, if, so the powers of z will be z to the power zero, z to the power one, all the way up to z to the power d. Um, the coefficients of a will be a zero all the way up to a d. And if you take the inner product of that, that's just the same thing as f evaluated at x. Uh, f evaluated at z. So, you know, that, that's why the inner product argument is kind of strictly more powerful than, uh, than the polynomial commitment scheme because it is just a very special case where the right hand side turns out to be the powers of the point that you want to evaluate at. Um, so, that's, that's how you would do the, uh, the, the, the opening in the if you were to use a, a, a bulletproof based um, polynomial com commitment. And the, uh, in bulletproofs, is it like the same efficiency to open uh, as a polynomial and a general uh -huh. inner product? So 
it turns out that as far as I can tell, the, the, the prover time is exactly the same, is basically the same for commitments and for openings. Um, and that's why in my table, I kind of talk here about just prover time. You know, but actually there's two prover times, right? There's the time to commit and the time to open. And the kind of the reason that they're, they're the same in the context of these logarithmic arguments is that um, here you commit to F and then you commit to something which is half of X. So that's going to take half the amount of work. And then you commit to something a quarter of the amount of work. And so if you add up all the work to do all these commitments, you get basically twice the amount of work. So, so yeah, so all the, all the work to do the commitments below here are equivalent to the amount of work to do the original com a commitment at, at the very beginning here. So yeah, in, in every scheme, um, because you, you're reusing the commitment internally, and these commitments become smaller and smaller, and their total work is the same as, as this. So the very top one is what you'd call the, the master commit, and then all the other ones would be the openings. Uh, but it turns out they're kind of equivalent. And um, it, th there was kind of something that I discovered uh, only uh, a few days ago, or I guess a, a few weeks ago. Um, the same thing happens for Kate. So, um, and it, it ha so it's, it, it's, it's, it's kind of obvious that for Kate, um, the, 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 the commitment and the opening have the, the, the same cost if you work in the monomial basis, but it's not, it's not obvious if you, if you have something in, in the Lagrange basis. And the reason is that your powers of tau is, is given to you <clears throat> Um, in, in the monomial basis. And so what you do, you know, traditionally is you'd, um, you'd, you'd, you'd take your, your polynomial in the Lagrange basis, you do an FFT to go in, in, uh, in the monomial, monomial basis, and then you, you, you do the multi-exponentiation. But it turns out that this trick, which it seems like no one is doing it, but it's kind of a cool trick where you can pre-compute your SRS in the Lagrange basis. Um, so you, you take the monomial basis and then you do this completely trustless and transparent transformation to transform it into the, uh, the Lagrange basis. And then when you want to do an opening or a commitment, you can just reuse this pre-computed, uh, basically new, new, new SRS. Um, and you, you don't have to bother with the, with the FFTs. You're saying that, uh, I, I give you the, <coughs> the point to open and you can compute this, uh, F of X minus F of Z divided by X minus C. You can compute it, uh, without any FFT. Yes, that's correct. Yes. So this is, this is really a very cool trick and actually does. There's another trick which uh, is in part four, which I guess I could tell. So basically, you're given the, you have a polynomial in the Lagrange basis. Okay, now you want to compute the, this, this quotient polynomial also in the Lagrange basis. Well, that's, 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 that's very easy to do in linear time without any FFT, because you just, you take what you have, you remove F of Z everywhere, and then you divide by X minus Z everywhere, and you can, all, you can do this in linear time. And now that you have the quotient and you have the pre-computed SRS, now you can also do the, the, the commitment as, as in the opening, the commitment of the quotient, i.e. the opening, also in linear time. And so this, I mean, there is one, one caveat, which is like, how do you compute the evaluation itself in linear time? And this is where another trick comes in which is a really, really beautiful trick, which it seems not many people in this space know, uh, which is this one. It's called the barycentric Lagrange interpolation. So let's kind of uh, unpack this equation a little bit. So you have, you have your roots of unity, which are the, the WI. 
So w to the zero all the way to w to the to the n or w to the d. Um, and then you, you have your Lagrange, you have f in the Lagrange basis. And what that means is you have the evaluations of f <coughs> at your roots of unity. So this is your roots of unity. You already have f evaluated at these roots of unity. So they're kind of already on your hard drive and you can just read them off because you have them. And then there's this equation which says that f of z, I'm missing f of z, f of z is equal to this thing. And this thing can just be computed in linear time because here you have a, a sum which is linear, you know, n. Um, so you, you just go through every element. Here you, you just read from your, your, your memory or your RAM or whatever, and then you divide by this, which, which take constant time. And, and, and this is just a constant that you have to, to compute once for, 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 for the whole sum. So basically, in, in, in summary, it, it turns out that you can do kind of optimal commitments and, and openings with Kate just in linear time regardless of your basis. So if you're, if you're in the monomial, monomial basis, it's trivial. If you're in the Lagrange basis, um, <clears throat> you need the pre-computation and you need this formula. But it turns out that you can pick any arbitrary basis. You can go like really creative and pick some exotic basis. And you have equivalent formulas here. <clears throat> the formula is not as nice. You know, there's a few extra terms because you don't have the nice algebraic properties of the, the roots of unity, but you can still do it. And the, the pre-computation trick of the SRS <clears throat> can also be done for any arbitrary basis. So where, where are we at right now in, in the presentation? Have we finished <clears throat> section three? Yes. Uh, Great. Yes, <laughs> section three. <laughs> Um, cool. Actually, no, there is one, there's two more slides, which are, well, one more slide, which is basically open problems. Okay. <coughs> like, you know, like, can you come up with new constructions? For example, you know, we, we've covered large parts of cryptography with hash functions, pairings, you know, elliptic curves and, and groups of unknown order. And so there's, there's a natural question, like, can you use the other Things. And one of the prime constructions that we have is lattices. So can you come with an, up a new scheme with lattices? Another interesting question is, can you come up with uh, more groups of unknown order? So we have RSA groups, class groups. Can you come up with something new? Um, and actually, Dan Bonnet is trying to make um, hyperelliptic curves work. Um, and so it, as I understand, these hyperelliptic curves, they um, they are groups of unknown order. It's like really difficult to compute the group of the order of the group, but they have um, they have a problem, which is that you can compute the 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 order of some elements in the group, um, and it turns out that you need a bit more than a group of unknown order. You need um, you need the so-called adaptive root assumption to hold, um, and this doesn't hold if you know um, even the order of of one group element. Um, yeah, and then there's all sorts of kind of, it would be interesting to find new polynomial com commitment schemes which apply to very specific use cases. So for example, if you have a sparse polynomial, uh, you know, you only have a, f um, so it's of, it's of degree D, but most of the terms are zero, for example. Can you find uh, ways to, <clears throat> to commit and open this polynomial in, you know, in time significantly less, less than D. Um, yeah. And actually this, this last problem, you know, about FFT minimization techniques, uh, you know, when I wrote my slides, that was one of the open problems, but I guess at least in the context of Kate, this, this has been solved, which is kind of very nice. What solved that? Was it the... Yeah, so there's two tricks. Um, so actually this, this barycentric trick was co-discovered, co-reinvented by Vitalik and Dan Bonnet. So Vitalik had this intuition saying, oh, I, I think I can do interpolation in linear time. And he came up with this, this recursive kind of program. He wrote Python code and he tested it. And then he showed the code to Dan. And Dan was like, oh, I can find a really nice closed formula for oh. that. 
Um, and then, you know, I discovered that actually this formula was known, you know, like 30 years ago. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then there's the other trick, which is the, the SRS pre-computation trick, which, um, which I just came up with. And I, as far as I can tell, no one is, is, is using. Oh, cool. Yeah. And the reason why I was going down this road is that I've been thinking for several weeks now, for almost a month, I've been trying to build um, snarks which, for which the prover does not require any FFT whatsoever. Um, and if you can crack that, then you can get basically optimal snarks uh, where both the, you know, the proof size, verifier time, and prover time are optimal. And when you remove the FFTs, you also really allow for very large circuits. So for example, you know, you, like trillion, trillion gate kind of circuits are not out of the question. And the reason is that these the the rest of the work that needs to be done, which is these um, multi exponentiations, they are they can be massively parallelized, um, parallelized, and they don't require much memory, um, and you know they can be accelerated with custom hardware. But the FFTs are kind of very awkward to deal with because you need a lot of memory and you need quite a bit of communication between the various parts. So it's there's a few moving parts which make it much more difficult to scale than, than the, the, the rest, than the other operations. Cool. Yeah. So I think we're going to wrap it up. We've gone a little bit over time. Um, but yeah, I guess thanks so much for putting this together again and running us and walking us through it. Do we need another session? So the uh -oh. final part is what I call polynomial gadgets. And Basically, the way that you, you build these IOPs is really you don't reuse the low-level polynomial commitment scheme. You have this, this new layer of abstraction, which I call polynomial gadgets, um, <clears throat> which are slightly more powerful. And these are the basic building blocks, the Lego blocks, with which you build your, your IOP. And so um, you know, I would present the cool. box gadgets um, if there's time. So there's, yeah. That sounds good. So I think we'll talk about maybe doing a third. And then, um, yeah, in the meantime, thanks for joining everybody. I think we're going we're gonna to wrap it up now.